The Garden of Eden is a real geographic location, and today's guest, Stan Dale, thinks he knows where it is. Sandeo, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it, Gary. It, this, I'm looking forward to this discussion because uh, uh, you've got a DVD set here which uh, has some wonderful uh, representations of geography. And, and you've gone to great lengths to clarify what a lot of people consider to be a myth. That is, the Garden of Eden uh, is something in the, the Bible but certainly it doesn't, it's not a real place. It doesn't actually exist. I think a lot of people believe that. However, you believe you actually know where it's located. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's amazing to me. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, <coughs> verses 10 through 14, and I won't uh, read the whole thing, but in, in that section of Scripture, we have uh, the Garden of Eden uh, with four rivers. Uh, one's the Pishon, one is the Gihon, uh, one is the Hiddekel, and one is the Euphrates. The last one, we, we of course, uh, know where it is today, and that links it to contemporary reality. Let's talk about uh, the garden and the rivers. Uh, you really have a story to tell. Well, uh, years ago, I did start trying to find the Garden of Eden using printed maps, long, mm -hmm. like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago. And we didn't have the detail that we have now on the internet through Google Earth and through Scripps Institute data files and things like that. So um, while I was researching another project uh, for a lecture that I was going to give at the uh, Prophecy Conference, I was studying um, the expanding Earth hypothesis, which says that the Earth has expanded from a previous smaller diameter, which explains why the continents are all uh, split apart. And while doing that, uh, I got the Scripps Institute to send me a really high-resolution map of the ocean bottoms that was never available to us before. In fact, they gave it to me two months before they even gave it to Google Earth. That's how fresh it is. Hmm. And when I got that and was looking at the coastlines of India and Africa, I realized that they all used to fit together. And according to standard physics, that was a hundred million years ago that they fit together. And they've been creeping apart inch by inch all that time. Mm -hmm. But um, when I saw this, put it back together with their map, I realized that the coastlines were formed by a water flow that cut deep grooves into the ocean bed, and that's where the continents broke eventually. So then I went back and I thought, I'll just look at my notes that I had from you know the 80s about the Garden of Eden and uh, the four rivers and see if I can find four rivers that fit into this area around India somewhere and mm -hmm. up into Israel. Now, you mentioned the last one, the fourth river <coughs> in Genesis 2.14. It's called uh, Euphrates. Now, in Hebrew, it's Ephrat. And in Hebrew, in another part of the Old Testament, it, it mentions about the, that great river, the river Ephrat in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Now, the ancients uh, in the use of Hebrew didn't have, like, uh, the rivers Ephrat, so they would repeat it to say that it was in more than one piece, it was broken. So the river Ephrat, uh, the great river, was in pieces. We know today of the piece that hangs down into the uh, Persian Gulf region coming up from the, the Turkish side. Mm -hmm. And we also know about the Tigris that, that runs to west of Asher at that point down there. Now, the Tigris, uh, most of us do uh, support the, the idea that that was called the Hidikel, uh, the third river around the Garden of Eden, or out of the Garden of Eden. So here you have the Hittichel and the Euphrates, and people think that, okay, those two rivers were full and intact of what we saw, and that's what the Garden of Eden tale must have referred to. And there have been a number of other people over the last couple hundred years, like even back to the time of Columbus, who tried to locate the Garden of Eden, and most of them were in the Middle East, uh, around uh, mm -hmm. uh, Israel and in Iran and in Turkey. Well, you know, uh, one hypothesis I've heard is that it was in what is today Saudi Arabia, near the Persian Gulf. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and in fact, certain Arab groups uh, stoutly cling to the fact that, uh, that the deserts there uh, were once the Garden of Eden, and one, one day they will be watered again and spring up and bloom all over. So that's kind of a, uh, a generated myth. Yeah, one Chinese uh, philosopher on it uh, in recent times said it was up near the North Pole somewhere. Uh, the 
Church of Latter-day Saints put it in Missouri. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, when I started this research, you know, by kind of by accident here as an adjunct to something else, I didn't bother to look up on the internet and see all the other places that people had uh, allegedly found the Garden of Eden until after it was over, and, and after I'd found it. If I had done that, I'd have probably thought, oh, I'm not going to join that nonsense. It's just too many people in the field. It's terrible, confusing. And, but I didn't. And um, the first thing that I saw, because I like to read the uh, Torah, the Genesis account, in mm, Hebrew, because I get closer to the original meaning of the words by being able to take it apart. Yes. And um, so here on the program here that um, AccordanceBible.com uh, you know, puts out to us, it says here in English, in the King James Version, and the fourth river is Euphrates, and uh, the third was Hiddekel, and the second was Gihon. And it says the same, this river Gihon is the same one that goes around, I'm paraphrasing, the whole land of Ethiopia. Now in the time of King James when they translated this, they all thought that Ethiopia was, um, well, all down the western side of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But it, it, uh, it, it doesn't say Ethiopia in the Hebrew. It's not even close. They just substituted that because the Hebrew said around the land of Cush with a K. Mm -hmm. And since they assumed that the Ethiopian up the western side of the Red Sea was uh, Cush with a C, Mm -hmm. that this was what they were talking about. So they just dropped in Ethiopia and everybody just kind of let it pass because they didn't look at the Hebrew. There are two Cushes. The Cush on the west side of the Red Sea, which is part of old Ethiopia, and the Cush with a K, which was set up by Nimrod, all the way over here on the other side of the Persian Gulf on the western slopes of uh, mountains of Iran. Hmm. That's where he built the Tower of Babel. And that land, I, I thought, well, is it possible that that is the Kush that they're talking about where this second river Gihon went around? So I started looking on a map of the whole Middle East, that area, looking for any town names or borders or rivers or anything else, ancient ones, started with a K like Kush or Kash, or with a Q, Kashan. Mm -hmm. And I found over 120 places that just outlined Iran and into India. Wow. Okay, and, that, and I stopped looking, that was enough, but there's more than that. So I realized that the old tribes over that came back after the flood named those areas uh, I I historically over what you know had happened before. You know, that's uh, as I'm sitting here listening to you, it's not uncommon even in our day. Ohio, the state of Ohio, the Ohio River, the state of Missouri, the Missouri River. You know, it, it, so a place name could derive from a, from a river. What about George Washington, Washington D.C., state of Washington, blah blah blah. You know, yeah, what, sure. So. I looked at the cultural bias on this and did find all over Iran and India and Pakistan and Afghanistan, all of them had this in there. And a great deal of them formed a border where you trace those names where they're located around the area. Either Iran and or India were in that. Anyway, by correcting that, I was able to then go to the high resolution Google Earth maps using the Scripps data and fly down at ground level almost, and trace over a quarter of a million miles for all four rivers, looking at it mile by mile to see the old riverbeds and why they were there where they came from. And three of them, you know, the, the one around Iran, India area, the Gihon, it came down the coast of, of um, like the Saudi Peninsula from Oman down to Yemen and into Ethiopia, into the Afar Triangle, and up through the Great East African Rift over into a place in northern Tanzania. Three of these rivers. The Euphrates was in two pieces. The one we know today, it went along the coastline of the Mediterranean on the west side of the Levant, you know, of, of uh, Israel and the countries that all go up into Turkey. It was either the Nile River or the Red Sea that was the original part, the headwaters of the Euphrates before the continents broke up. When you put everything back together again in this small earth or expanding earth theory, they all come together at this same place. That would be a good place to, to stop for a little explanation because you mentioned the continents breaking up. I think uh, probably most of our audience has heard this before. It's fairly commonly uh, taught that 
that the continents were, were all together at one spot at a certain point in history and they separated and they flung out and, and now they're widespread. Uh, India and Africa were very close to each other, if not touching at one point in time, and they spread apart. Perhaps the United States, North South America used to touch Africa, and they spread apart. So what you're saying is that, that you're trying to backtrack and, and, and replay this thing in reverse and find out where the land masses were in, originally, as mentioned in Genesis, and then from that, hopefully find your way to the, the location of the ancient Garden of Eden. Yes, exactly. And uh, there was a problem I had to deal with in that if I put all the continents back together again in what uh, the uh, geologists call Pangaea, um, if I did that, I would have to say that they were all together a hundred million years ago. And that's probably a little bit before the Garden of Eden was was created according to the biblical legend. If you just calculate the rate of drift today and sort of reverse that, it would take 100 million years. Yes, and that's, uh, to me that was a mistake in that they were using gradualism, this gradual continental tectonic plate drift like this, and the upwelling of the seabed to form the Atlantic Ridge and the Pacific you know, Basin. and oh, That didn't, didn't work with me, and I thought, I'll put it all back together again. I will ignore the fact that it had to happen 100 million years ago and say, let us suppose it happened more recently, and let's find the Garden of Eden. And when I did find it, um, and, and, and I'll, I'll be more specific about that in a minute, it means that if people accept what I have found, which agrees with the Genesis account absolutely word for word, the locations, the time, everything, if they accept that, then modern science is going to have to change their time frame down to thousands of years rather than hundreds of millions for the, the Pangaea breakup. Now how can they do that? What they do is they measure the age of the earth and the universe by uh, radioactive decay mm -hmm. and by some other inferred uh, uh, occurrences, but mainly about the rate at which say carbon-14 or argon uh, gases decay. They're assuming, and this is incorrect, they're assuming the speed of light is constant, does not vary, they're assuming that the uh, depositing rates of carbon-14 were constant, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. When you correct the error, uh, like uh, Barry Setterfield did, he's an astronomer from Australia, uh, he, he calculated that the speed of light from the measured uh, uh, speeds from back in probably 200 years ago to now from scientists, that the measured speed of light has slowed down over that 200 year period. Now classical science says, oh well that's rubbish because now we've got lasers and we can see that the speed of light just does not vary very much at all. And, but uh, Setterfield's equation shows that the speed of light is down here almost constant now, but 200 years ago it was slightly faster and they can calculate a formula that shows where it was at the Big Bang. And we will accept the Big Bang as an event, okay? God spoke and bang there was. be light. What the classical physicists are missing is this. At the Big Bang, the entire universe, the mass of it, was down in this little tiny spot, very dense. And a wave like light, which is what we're basing radioactive decay on, a wave like sound, if I'm speaking to you now, it's reaching at maybe you know, 1,100 feet per second. If there were a block of nickel metal between us and I tried to speak to you, and let's say I spoke hard, the sound would travel four times faster to you at 4,400 feet per second because there's more molecules there for it to shake up like that. So if the universe is more dense and all electromagnetic radiation, light rays, etc., they would have to travel much faster because of the density. And what Zetterfield has calculated is that the speed of light just after the Big Bang mm -hmm. was at least 100 million times faster than it is now. So what does this mean? It means that radioactive decay occurred so much faster, millions and millions of times faster, that the, the period of time that they're, they're attributing at 100 million years is really down to maybe 10,000 years. So all of these events can be packed into a, a much, uh, if you will, shorter era yes. because of a dilation effect. Now, you're saying uh, the, the speed of light is not constant, which, by the way, is almost a, re a religious dogma these days. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the constancy of the speed of light. 
uh, but but that it, it shifts, it changes, and, and as you go back and look at the history of, of creation, that is a huge factor. And the, the breaking apart of, of the ancient Pangaea into various parts of the earth could have taken place much more quickly than is traditionally yes. supposed. And if you accept what I have located as the Garden of Eden, as told after the flood by some author, if you accept that, you're going to have to accept the fact that it wasn't 100 million years ago that Pangaea broke up, which means even if, if, mm -hmm. if the speed of light, uh, the, uh, the hypothesis I'm putting across on behalf of Centerfield, even if you don't accept that, there's something wrong with the way we're dating the universe. Well, looking at my Bible again here in Genesis 10, verse 25, and unto Eber uh, were born two sons. Now this is the family of Japheth, the family of uh, Ham, the family of Canaan, the family of Shem. And right in this uh, genealogy it says, unto Eber were born two sons. Uh, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And uh, we, we look back and we see, well, yes, the earth was divided. Everybody agrees on that. Yes. But the Bible says in the days of Peleg. Well, in his time, he was uh, within, say, he started life within 150 to 200 years after the flood. Mm -hmm. Now, because I'm using this compressed time or, you know, relative time dilation, um, I can use an event, a catastrophic event like the Chicxulub meteor that impacted the Gulf of Mexico. It threw a shockwave into the core of the earth that bounced eastward with the turn of the core and hit underneath India and bounced like that for several, well, almost 200 years. It was a bouncing effect that kept on bouncing and split India off toward the Himalayas. It created the Himalayas because there's seashells on top of the Himalaya mountains. So it shoved like the skin of pudding when you're cooking it. It shoved up the mountains as it separated India from Northeast Africa. Um, and that catastrophic event led to the eventual breakup of, of the uh, continents uh, when the earth was divided in the time of Peleg. Now I should point out at this time that if your head is spinning just a little bit, uh, we have a solution here. We have a, a, a set of three, three DVDs, uh, one of which features the Garden of Eden lecture by Stan, and it actually contains maps, it contains graphics to allow you to see what he's talking about. Now for the, the big question. I've been waiting now for several minutes to ask this question. Where is the mm -hmm. Garden of Eden after all of this? Well, when you put all the factors together, it is in northern Tanzania in northeast Africa. Northeast Africa? Yeah. Okay. Um, if this is Madagascar down here, there's the coast of East Africa and Tanzania is on the coast and runs up like that up to a touch with Kenya. It's in a place called Ngoro Ngoro. That's local for big hole. Okay. <laughs> big, big hole. <laughs> yeah. And it is a big hole, but it is the only collapsed uh, volcano left in the world with the walls intact. Hmm. It looks like a crater. It's 100 square miles in area. Its floor of it is around uh, roughly 5,400 feet in altitude above sea level, but the walls are another couple of thousand feet above that. Yeah. And then the water sources are even higher uh, at around 10 to 12,000 feet. Now, I had to find this in Gorongoro uh, by tracing the rivers back up to that area. I found all four rivers and I found that that uh, in the process that uh, one of Solomon's gold mines was on Madagascar on the eastern coast. All these things are clues about what lands were known for their gold and this kind of thing. Remember that the account that we have in the Genesis account of Eden was written after the flood, but it was written before the continent split because they're talking about rivers, not coastlines. Mm -hmm. And if you'll find, if you'll look in the book of Jubilees, which is outside the Bible, but it tells how Noah gave the land grants to his three sons and mentions the Garden of Eden in that, and you can trace that down. When everything's back together, you can trace it down to the east coast of Africa as far as, as one of the rivers. The Ngoro, or Garden of Eden, is um, in, in the Genesis account, it says a river came out of Eden. But in the ancient Hebrew use of that word, there's two, there's current and, and old Hebrew. The old Hebrew use of out of says, that the river came up out of Eden to form the water, the four rivers, and to water the garden. 
that's a spring. The word that they use for up out of even is used to describe tree limbs in a, in a tree, how it branches out like that. It was a huge spring. So I started looking for springs in the Ngoro uh, area, you know, all that high plateau. And I found not one, but over 20 of them that are still, you can still see their footprints in the, the dirt there. One of them was 20 acres in area, one spring, mm -hmm. and it put out enough water gushed up from underneath to generate three rivers nearly 5,000 miles long each and cut holes in the surface of the earth. So by doing that, we found where the water came up out of divided into four rivers. Oh, I see. Well, that's really... Now, let me just uh, stop right there for a moment. And right. I want to read a little bit more scripture here. All right. Uh, because we, we all know the, the biblical story about Adam and Eve uh, having sinned, having eaten the, the forbidden fruit. And God said, uh, you, you must now make lives for yourselves. In Genesis 3.23, therefore the Lord uh, God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So not only were they chased out of the garden, the garden was guarded so that they couldn't return. And they, they go to the east. Uh, this would have been before the breakup yes. of, of the land. Yes. And where would they have gone? Well, let me address uh, Harubim and uh, the, the flaming sword. The cherubs, in the ancient use of the word, meant big, powerful thing. Okay, in the modern version, they, you look at either a Botticelli angel, a little, you know, right. or you look at God's field marshal that comes in and moves mountains when he passes. But in the ancient form, it was a big, powerful thing. It was dangerous. And the flaming sword, the ancient meaning of that, there's two ways to read it, can also mean a spinning, spiraling heat that sparkles. Now, come back over to the east of the Garden of Eden today in Ngoro. There are 42 volcanoes around it. Wow. The biggest is Mount Kilimanjaro, which is called the Mountain of Light by the ancients. And it was a huge thing. It was even described in the Book of Jubilees as a, one of the markers that's east of Eden, which illuminated the pathway to Eden. It didn't prevent you, but it was hot. So well, that's, it that's is there. Really inter interesting. Now, uh, that being said, you, we've honed in on, on the geography of Eden. You were telling me that there is even a place name close by, uh, which uh, has a modern name, you can find it on a map, Aden, A-D-E-N, which is really close to the pronunciation of Eden. Yes, it's the way that's pronounced in Hebrew and Arabic is Aden. And it's in Yemen, on the coast of Yemen, on a, a little finger that juts out. It's an ancient volcano that is now um, defunct or extinct. And it's called the Aden Volcano. And the Arabs built a city inside that, that uh, volcano, you know, like a collapsed one. Mm -hmm. And the Arab legend in Yemen says that Cain and Abel are buried there. Wow. Now, in those days when the volcanoes were still active over in, in Goro, just up the river there, up the Great East African Rift, uh, you didn't want to go there. And they knew they were kicked out of the garden. So Cain and Abel couldn't go back. None of their descendants wanted to go back to the garden because God had prevented it. So when they buried Cain and Abel, they buried him in a replica, a small crater there in Yemen. And I've, I've talked to a couple of Muslims that emailed me about this, and they said, yes, that's true. We believe that's, that's where they were buried. And it makes a lot of sense because the migration pattern north and east out of the Garden of Eden went through Ethiopia and down into Yemen and out to the rest of the world. Well, needless to say, this is a huge subject, and we have barely scratched the surface on today's program. I just want to remind you that, that if you want to pursue this, you can get Stan's DVD set. And by the way, there are three DVDs in, in this, Lectures and Interviews, uh, The Garden of Eden, and uh, we have Stan's uh, uh, dissertation on the Antichrist and uh, his relationship with the biblical Solomon. All of these DVDs are just absolutely information packed and fascinating. Uh, ordinarily we uh, would ask uh, the thirty nine ninety five, but what we're going to do uh, and what we always do is increase the value by uh, uh, combining the, the DVDs with Stan's book called The Cosmic Conspiracy. I don't know how to s describe The Cosmic Conspiracy except to say that it talks about everything from anti-gravity and UFOs to, to the implications of modern physics to Bible prophecy. 
it's a read. It is, I guarantee you, it's a journey. And uh, we are offering both of these uh, in what we're calling the Stan Dale package for $59.95. Uh, this is about a $70 value for $59.95. And we would love to send you the, the DVDs and Stan's book, The Cosmic Conspiracy. And we're going to talk to Stan about his book on another program. So uh, you'll want to stay tuned for that. Stan, we've got about three minutes. Let's, let's tie this up in a bow. Okay, the Garden of Eden is real. It's there today. And one of the funny things about it is the tourist agencies over there call Ngoro, the Garden of Eden. They say, come visit Africa's, well, last Garden of Eden. And they don't even know they've got the real thing there. Mm -hmm. 500,000 people a year go there. It's a conservancy so that you can't live there, you can't destroy it. Mm -hmm. UNESCO is protecting it, strangely enough. Kings and queens go visit it. Wow. And it, it is a real place. This means that the Bible is true. You know, it, to me this is, I mean, I was a believer before this, but this has cemented my own faith, seeing that that place I can read out, reach out and touch it and pick up red earth that our DNA is made from. Isn't wow. that incredible? Well, Adam in Hebrew means red. The man of the red earth. He was made of red earth. Yes. How about that? He was a, 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 I, spo I suppose, of ruddy co complexion if you wanted to take it all the, all the way. And you know, these geneticists have traced back the mitochondrial Eve back to that exact location, well, 200 miles from there in the Omo Valley where Adam and Eve left and went and, and uh, had their children, their offspring. Um, the old Duvai Gorge... Um, ancient hominid uh, you know, museum is five miles outside the Garden of Eden. Now that's amazing. I think everybody's heard of Lucy, the little ape-like creature from which humanity was supposed to have sprung. Uh, <laughs> the, the way the Bible says it, it says it exactly the opposite, that, that man was created in God's image but later on degenerated. So yes. I think maybe the evolutionists have it backward. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. That explains so much of the, of the uh, ancient ape-like bodies and, and the progression, you know, in, in evolutionary theory, it's really devolution from crossbreeding. But what an irony that modern science is looking in precisely that area to yes. find traces of ancient man. They say it all started there. It all started there. Now, this is amazing to me. If you've ever read your Bible and thought in the back of your mind, well, you know, this is a good story. It's probably not 100% true. No, it's 100% true. <laughs> when you know how to read the Bible, you always discover it's 100% true. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah, well, I encourage people to read their Bible, to um, even study Hebrew. You can do it in a couple of weeks. And look in the book of Daniel, look in the book of the Revelation of John in, in Greek. There are things that are necessary for our time that are still locked in there that we haven't decoded yet. I know you've been looking into Daniel. I have indeed, and you know, Daniel is, is sort of a, uh, a book that's been read and put away. And, and people say, oh, we already understand that. We don't have to study it anymore. Oh, yes, we do, because the Lord is constantly opening up new channels of information. That's the exciting thing about being alive today, Stan, and you bring us a degree of excitement that uh, we haven't had for a while. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Stan Deo, you need to see his video. I am Gary Stearman. Wishing you a great day in the Lord. Keep watching, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching, everybody, and we'll see you soon.